name is Barry Callahan, and um, I want to tell you a little something about Irving Layton. I refer to him happily as my old pal, Irving. I met him in the 60s when I had become the literary editor of a big Toronto newspaper called the Toronto Telegram. It was known in those days as the Pink Telly, because believe it or not, they actually published their front page on pink paper, uh, which was vaguely appropriate because it was a red Tory paper. It was the conservative voice in town. How I ended up there, I have no idea, but I did, and because I was there, Irving ended up there as well. It became, I suppose, what you might call a highly literate book page, in that we not only published uh, the best book reviews we could find, but we published poetry, and we published prose by poets, and that's what Irving did. Irving, at that time in his life, he was traveling all over the world. He was a kind of whirly gig on the wind. Uh, and I think the first pieces I published by Irving in the telegram came from Jerusalem and Tel Aviv. He'd gone over there. He sent me poems and he sent me prose pieces. And I had the audacity, I remember, to take two prose pieces that he sent to me, and without consulting with him, I condensed them into one. And I wrote him and I told him that I had done this, and of course I got the ballistic letter from him, uh, accusing me of all crimes and sins against uh, literary humanity anyway. Uh, and then the note ended with him saying, but of course you're right and I accept what you've done. Uh, this was the basis of what became a lifelong friendship between the two of us. Uh, we met in Toronto when he came back, and then I went down to Montreal. And in Montreal, uh, we had supper together in his uh, flat, in his apartment, with Aviva and his son, David. And um, that's when I began writing about Irving, what became, over the years, a long and substantial piece. Each time the mysterious flower of silence opened its invisible blossoms, those blossoms over my head, I felt the same thrill of power, of exulting joy. I, I, Irving alone, had punched a rectangular space of quiet into the filthy, drunken chaos and presented it to those older and stronger than myself. Leighton, in full stride, in long pants, his arm thrust into the night is still crying. I, I alone, I curse all the passionless worms that slide their fearful gray forms over this astonishing earth. Let them dissolve like rain into the sought-for mud. Let their worm eyes explode from a sudden, unlooked-for glimpse of God. Perhaps with Irving as God's agent, there had been a moment of silence among the exultant, cruel horrors of his house and the sheeny men of the neighborhood and the English on the mountain who had seemed to have the mysterious power of huge mastiffs. A silence amidst all the noise and pain of the Jewish quarter, noise that had presented him with a huge possibility, the thrill of power, as if the opening up of silence could be, as he wrote, like a milk-white kitten curled up on the bough of an apple tree, a gigantic blossom until its green eyes blink. <laughs>